Hey everybody, welcome once again to the ABA's bi-weekly bird ID live stream slash show. My name is Nate Swick. I am the digital communications manager for the American Birding Association. I am joined, as I frequently am, by my partner in these What's This Bird live uh, deals with uh, by Greg Neese. Hello, hello. Chicago, Illinois. Hello, Greg. It's it's spring. I don't know about you, but uh, there's a lot of birds around. I've been getting a lot of first of years, FOSs, first of seasons. Uh, it is. A lot of warblers. How about you? <laughs> yes. Uh, well, no, no. And actually, it's it's kind of funny. This is the this is the time of year for us where it's that it, it happens almost every year. We get a we get a warm push in early April, mid April, and some birds come up. And it's usually the early stuff like Northern Perula, Louisiana water thrush, yellow-throated warbler, and that's it. And then it gets cold, and the birds, those birds just stick for two weeks, and yeah. they become and they become celebrities. So at a at a pond in Lincoln Park, there is a, a Louisiana water thrush that I swear at least 150 people have taken pictures <laughs> of this Louisiana <laughs> water thrush this week. And everybody's taking first... pictures of this Louisiana yeah, I, water thrush. I heard my first Louisiana one on first date. They usually arrive uh, early part of March, but uh, you know where I specifically, right where I live, it usually takes a little bit longer. I had my first uh, the other day. Haven't seen it yet. Did hear it? It was singing its uh, singing its singing its heart out uh, soon after the first blue winged warbler. <clears throat> Typically, you know those early early migrants are starting to trickle in. Uh, it's been a little cold. We had some some wind out of the north the last couple nights and i imagine that's pretty much stalled everything out uh, for the most part so we're not getting anything new um though next week is supposed to be back up in the in the 70s and the 80s down here in north carolina and uh, well we had snow at the beginning of the week and i mean uh, yeah right the system the system that dusted us really hit ohio i mean there was yeah yeah i saw pictures of uh, I, i think I think it was Ohio, like a barn swallow sitting in an inch and a half of snow on the ground. Um, yeah, it's tough for those birds, but uh, they they usually, if it doesn't last too long, they can they can make it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, down here they they're holding out. We still have bugs and and you know catkins and all that stuff out for the birds to eat. But uh, next week it's going to be warm. It's going to be seventies. It's going to be eighties. So I imagine that everything is just going to come barreling in. And hopefully they will stick around. If they don't, they'll just like overshoot us and go straight up north to the Great Lakes, like they do some years. Well, I mean, I, I was I think last time we talked, um, you know, I was worried about an overshoot spring, and um, it looks like we're not going to get that this year because the cold weather came in and and just kind of stopped all the vegetation, the trees, which looked like they were you know well on their way to leafing out and the and flowering out, just stopped. Um, we've had a couple of hard freezes, and that's been that's been good for us, good for the birding. So when the birds get yeah. here, uh, it's it's they're gonna find food and stick around for at least a little bit. Yeah, I'm gonna pause right here and, and note that I'm having a little bit of a technical issue here. I cannot see any comments on Facebook, or I cannot. Um, I I can see, see the comments. Um, let me uh, let there me just. Are. I can't write. I can't. Um, comment can't i did there you do you see that comment there it is oh it's in a different they moved it and put it in a different place all right no that's annoying okay all right we'll just have to keep an eye on it on a different place yep um, I, well i can i can see it too yeah all right all right cool so um we're good um yeah you're not com- i see you now commenting. thanks heidi so now you are commenting. Yeah, thanks thanks for pointing that out um yeah, so as as usual, we are streaming to uh, the ABA accounts on uh, What's This Bird, the Facebook group What's This Bird, uh, to the ABA's YouTube account, and to Twitter, which is a brand new thing that we're trying. Uh, hopefully people will be able to comment there. It's been a bit of an issue. Uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll keep working it. If you ask any questions of us, we're going gonna to keep an eye on the on the various places, and we'll, we'll try and see them, pick them up as we come. So, um 
What we typically do here is uh, Greg will grab a few images from the ABA's What's the Spurred Facebook group. If you're not familiar with that group, it is essentially a crowdsourced bird identification community. If people have an image that they want of a bird that they want identified, they can post it on there and our friendly, usually friendly group of <laughs> regular commenters will uh, come on and actually help you identify that bird in pretty short order. Uh, the yeah. success record on this thing is is success rate, I should say, is is remarkably good. And, uh, yeah. you know, everyone has photos. Everyone has a camera that they carry around in their pockets these days. So we get a lot of photos. Uh, but what Greg has done is he's if picked you're... out a few of the more interesting ones. Oh, so go ahead and finish. Oh, Greg has picked out a few of the interesting ones. Um, some of them are, are birds that we're seeing a lot of. Some of them are birds that are just sort of interesting early spring migration challenges that we want to talk about. And we're gonna we're gonna work our way through those identifications. And of course, if anyone has any questions about birds or bird ID or anything else, please let us know in the comments, and we will we will have a look and we will answer those questions because there's nothing Greg and I like doing more than talking about birds. Very true. I was gonna say that yeah, it, what you were saying about the success rate of the group. Uh, if your bird isn't isn't positively ID'd in ten minutes, uh, it's probably a <laughs> or you goal. get your money back. It's probably a gull. Yeah, no. Yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> Nobody gets any money back. No. Positively ID'd in 20 minutes for your money back. <laughs> Hearing that my audio is a little weird, I can pull my mic up a little closer. Maybe I, no, you know what? I think I had. I think I had two feeds on for your for your audio. Oh, I turned one off, so go. I think so. Yeah. I think it should be all right. Um, in stereo. Thanks. Uh, who mentioned that? I forget who it was. Uh, Nat Carmichael. Thanks for pointing that out. Uh, but yeah, you should be uh, not in stereo. Uh, so I think we can jump to today's yeah, do it. photos do it. and just give me a second because I may have to turn your audio on for you here. So just uh, yep. give me oh, a second oh, after oh. we switch. And uh, OK, go ahead. I think you're good. Uh, yes, yeah, so we have three uh, species of bird in this image, uh, which is kind of cool. Though I'm, I'm pretty sure I know which of those three that people are interested in having. Well, yeah, the, the, the bird, the dark bird in the center is what the, the, the poster was uh, curious about. But yes, we do we have can do all three. We can do all we, three. We can, if you we want. can do all three. Right. Let's do all three. Yeah. More is yeah. better. Yeah. Uh, so, so um, yeah, go ahead. Do the <laughs> I'll, I'll take the white. I'll take the white birds and you can okay. take the, the dark one. So um, okay. we've got two different types of white herons here. Uh, both look superficially similar but there's a couple different things going on you'll notice the one down at the bottom has a yellow bill the one up at the top has a black bill the one up at the top generally looks a bit more delicate it's got those kind of real fine filigree uh, feathers coming out of its neck and on top of its head that are lacking on the bird down below us um, when we're looking at white herons in the aba area we only have um, four of which only two or probably three are likely to be found in in uh, New Jersey, we can eliminate probably cattle egret based on the habitat. They like kind of pastures where you might find cattle or livestock as per the name. So now we're down to great and snowy egret. And one of the great things that we have here, well, and little blue heron, uh, we have one of each. We have a great egret down here with the bright, big yellow bill. And we have a, uh, a snowy egret up at the top with the delicate looking uh, black bill. And um, yeah, we know that that's not a little blue heron because it's got those kind of neat fringy feathers mm -hmm. uh, and it's, you know, it's April. So I wouldn't expect to see too many all white little blue herons around right now since that is the juvenile plumage. And yep. uh, you won't see those until late summer. So the dark bird, um, the dark bird is an ibis and uh, we can, uh, you know, there's, there's two species of dark ibis in the ABA area. Um, technically three if you count juvenile white ibis, but they're really not like this. They're not all dark. Um, and you wouldn't see too many of them in April. That's another another thing. Yeah, yeah. They tend to move a little bit later in the year uh, up the coast um, to New Jersey, if they do at all. Uh, but um, so we have two dark ibis, and the two dark ibis are a constant uh, ID conundrum. And it gets 
harder when they're juvenile birds. And that's a discussion for another day because it's April and this is an adult bird. <laughs> and the discussion for September. Yeah. <laughs> I, well, in a nutshell, at, up to a certain age, you can't identify them. And anybody who says that they can, can't. I mean, up to a certain point. Um, but again, that's a topic for another discussion. But here with an adult, um, it's fairly straightforward if you can get a good look. And so we're going to compare the two of them here. Uh, and um, so I've put in a uh, white-faced ibis on the right to the left of this glossy ibis. And a couple of things you'll notice right away is the white-faced ibis has a lot more white on the face. Now, this, this the reason individual... The white-faced ibis. It's a na there's a reason for that. <laughs> um, this individual is, has, is like at the extreme end. It's got a lot of white in the face. Um, but they always have white behind the eye, and you'll notice that the, the glossy ibis does not. Uh, it's, got a, it's got a bluish white line in front of the eye, and a bluish white line under the eye. But also look at the bill and the face. In the glossy ibis, the bill and the face are one color. It's that kind of gray, flat, matte gray mm -hmm. color. The white-faced ibis has a red face patch that is very noticeably different, even in this darkly lit uh, bird. It's very different from the bill color. And the bill tends to be a little pinkish too. Uh, so when you, when you, especially if you see them side by side like this, it's, it's really pretty obvious. Yeah. Um, at this time of year is the best time of year to identify these birds because they're kind of in their breeding finery and the white face on a white faced ibis is really big and thick and obvious. And as Greg said, you know, glossy does have that little bit of white on the face. And sometimes you get people who are trying to turn that into white faced ibis, but as long as that white does not go behind the eye, um, you're pretty sure you're going to have glossy. And of course, glossy is the expected ibis in New Jersey uh, most times of year. Uh, white is primarily in the western part of the continent. Though they are, there is a pattern of vagrancy of white-faced ibis to the eastern half, uh, though typically that is a, a later in the year phenomenon, um, at least where I am. Though, you know, they could be seen any time. And if it's being attacked by a peregrine falcon, then it's most likely a white-faced yeah uh, exactly i don't know if you've seen if you've seen that video <laughs> go to youtube it's awesome peregrine falcon attack yeah because it's yeah. <laughs> you just gotta see it yeah. Those of you on youtube already there we already have a question greg oh on youtube if we want to oh, grab the it just before yeah we let's move on. let's go let's do uh, chris spurgeon asks he's driving across the country la to new york city via via utah colorado nebraska iowa illinois anyway he's going to yeah. a lot of spots any must bird spots you should hit when you're crossing the country uh, in the month of May? Holy mackerel. Yeah, there's a yeah. lot of options there, man. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the uh, Holly Miner notes Antelope Island in Utah is a great place to bird. Can't disagree with that. Um, this time of year, the Great Plains, I, you know, I, I would suggest, you know, something like Quivira or uh, Cheyenne Bottoms in Kansas as well that are kind of right off I-70. If that's you're... really more of an August August sort of thing, although the birding yeah. probably can be pretty good in March in May as well. Yeah, if you're going but if you're going the northern route through uh, through uh, Colorado, like not Denver going on Kansas anyway, yeah, on I eighty, um, yeah, Loveland Loveland Pass for white tailed ptarmigan. Um, mm -hmm. People are getting them every almost every day now. Uh, and going through uh, northern Ohio. Um, Look, sounds like it might be what is it I ninety that skirts the south side of Lake Erie. That's a phenomenal place to bird, even yeah. into mid May. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the the really hot spots like uh, McGee Marsh and things like that are closed uh, for the most part. Although but, there's sort of a lottery system they've inst instituted for uh, for McGee Marsh this year. Depending on when um, it is you're coming through, uh, check if you're coming through the Chicago area like I eighty, Montrose mm -hmm. Point is open and. Montrose Point can be just off the hook awesome. Um, you know, if you're from yeah. the West Coast and don't see a lot of warblers, uh, the, the warbler viewing, there's not quite as many, 
but the viewing experience is similar to the McGee Marsh Boardwalk because the birds are down low, um, yeah. and it's a migrant trap, and you can get just just killer killer looks at Montrose. I would Point. probably beeline to the Great Lakes just kind of generally <laughs> for mid May, um, yeah, and you know just plan to hit a lot of spots kind of yeah. along the south side of the Great Lakes this time of year is probably going to be some really good birding opportunities. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's uh, hit the button let's here. Move on to our next bird. So this one's from Nevada, and uh, I thought this is this is interesting because w- that there's birds that shape. There are birds shaped like this that uh, can confuse people, and even mm-hmm. even really good birders. Um, so you know we've got a, a kind of a long lanky bird with a long tail and kind of a long bill and it's brown um and it's got long legs so it looks like it runs and uh i wouldn't hold it against you if your first thought was a road runner especially in mm-hmm. nevada um and i've seen people um mistake ring pheasant which has a general shape similar to this for a road runner mm-hmm. um but it's not. Uh, this yeah. is a great-tailed grackle. And yeah, it lacks a few things that I would want to see for Roadrunner. It is sort of long and lanky, but it's not like overly long and lanky. I mean, Red Roadrunner has a really long neck, as you can see in that image, and much longer legs, um, and a much heavier bill. You know, great-tailed grackle does have a pretty heavy bill, at least for blackbirds, as far as blackbirds are concerned, but uh, not heavy enough uh, for a Roadrunner. And uh, the little patch around the eye, would be a um, would be something you'd want to see as well. Uh, but this is a female uh, great tailed grackle, and they are kind yep. of that kind of rufousy brown yep. all over, mousy brown. And uh, yeah, they can look a bit like a like a road runner, though uh, less streaky. So this is this is going to take us into the uh, the form, uh, the gestalt, the the birding by form the portion vibes. of the, the vibes. What's what what kind of vibe does this give give you? Yeah. And you know just looking at these two birds side by side, even though they are very similar in a way, as we've been discussing, they're really very different. I mean, when you see the two side by things. side, yeah. they, they feed differently. Um, and even though they both have long legs, long tails, they're long and lanky, they're brown, they have long bills, they're very, very different. And mm-hmm. this is where learning the structure of a bird uh, is is really helpful in being able to tell quickly um, that, you know, looking at that grackle, we're just simply not dealing with a roadrunner and there's no reason to even consider it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they do different things. You know, yep. roadrunner has that kind of uh, stop and start kind of way of foraging. You know, they'll run real fast and then they'll stop and take a look around, look for stuff to eat, and then they'll run forward a little bit. Whereas a grackle, when they're foraging on the ground it's much more methodical the kind of high step along slowly walking around and, and picking into the grass to look for you know beetle larva and, and whatever else they can find in there uh, it's a different way of feeding and, and you'll get a, a very different impression when you see these birds kind of doing their thing yeah and i mean and if you're familiar with blackbirds picking stuff out of the lawn uh that's mm. that's what they do that's a uh, yep. we've got a question on facebook can you recommend any birding spots that have auto trails for those of us who can't walk very well? Um, most national wildlife refuges, uh, or I should say a lot of them, a lot of them do. Mm-hmm. Um, Hor- Horicon in Wisconsin has a fantastic driving trail. Um, uh, what's it called? Uh, Black Blackwater Point in Merritt Island. Is that correct? Yeah, where where in the world? Uh, yeah, Chris Ortega asks. Uh, we, we help to narrow it down, but as Greg says, yeah, National Wildlife Refuges generally have automobile loops, auto loops mm-hmm. um, that will take you through some of the best birding places at the at the refuge. And um, yeah, you can. That's that's the first place I would check. Um, yeah, yeah, Ding Darling. That's another fantastic one. Um, you know, down here where I live, um, Alligator River has a wildlife loop. Um, uh, Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge in Northern Ohio kind of famously has a really great wildlife loop that takes you through all the impoundments. Um, there's some there's some good stuff. Laguna Atascosa. Um, yep. It, there's a lot of good places to bird. National Wildlife Refuges are set up to be accessible to everyone. 
Yep. So, um, and that includes people whose mobility is not um, maybe lacking. So uh, definitely National Wildlife Refuges are the, are the way to go. And fortunately, those are kind of all over all over the country. Yeah. And uh, all right. So I'm going to get on into the next. Um, uh, Chow Jimmy Wu says some popular wildlife refuges may have shuttle services, uh, though they may be affected by the pandemic. That's true. Um, Santa Ana used to have a nice shuttle, uh, that I think has been mm -hmm. closed for, for quite some while, but they still, but they still do it for special occasions. Fingers um, crossed they'll be open again soon. Yeah. Well, yeah, they will. I mean, it's just a, it's a matter of, of when, not if, um, all right, we're going to bop into the next one here. And, uh, I really it like this right one. Now. Good spring I, bird. <laughs> yeah, I really like this one. I spent some time on this one this morning. Um, so yeah, this is this is a bird that shows up in all kinds of places. Uh, now you can you can guess by this picture that this bird uh, is a bird of open fields. It's not in forest and it's not out in a marsh. Um, and you can also guess by the plants around it uh, that it's small. It's sparrow sized. Um, mm -hmm. And big, big if, triangular conical bill. Yep. Um, but if you look at the colors, impact. good sparrow clues. You know, if you looked at the colors and said meadowlark, uh, I wouldn't hold it against you because it does look just like a meadowlark as far as the the front of the bird. It's got that nice black cravat and a yellow breast, and it's nice and bright. Um, but it's not. Uh, this is a dick sissel, and Dick Sissel is kind of a unique bird. Um, it's placed among the blackbirds, but it's obviously not a blackbird in the, you know, colloquial sense. Um, but it confuses a lot of people. Uh, and the thing to, to look at here, aside from the color, as Nate points out, is the structure. Look at that big honking bill. And um, so we're going to, compare it with some things that are frequently confused with uh, a dick sissel. And that is a metal arc. Yeah. yeah, this is really neat. You see these two birds in the same places all the time. Yep. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a really fascinating example of convergent, what is called convergent evolution, which is essentially when you have two different birds from different families that are not really that closely related to each other. And then they end up evolving a very similar look uh, because of the they live in similar places, there's actually a third species of bird uh, from Africa. Uh, there's a number of, of long long claws. Yeah, I think yep. Chris Ortega said he thought they were a cardinalid. I, I think that's accurate. I think they're cardinals. Oh, you're they right. You're right. You're right. A cardinalid. They have been they have been in sparrows. They have been with the embarrassed sparrows. They have been with the they may have been with the blackbirds, um, or maybe you're thinking of bobolink. But, no, um, I'm showing my age is what is what's happening. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, I mean it may have been. A, yeah, I it wouldn't shock me. It's been no, they are card. No, you're right. They are cardinalids, and and yeah, yeah. But the, there's a there's a third group of bird, and and meadowlarks are uh, blackbird orioles. Um, Correct. And there's a third group that's related to the pipits, which is a group of bird called long claws, uh, which are found in the similar sort of sub-Saharan Africa grassland, meadowy type places that look exactly the same as well. They have the their yellow with the black V across, um, and that's probably because they can be both camouflaged on the back, right? And then when they want to display, they sit up in a prominent place and they show off that yellow, and then it's very easy to see them. From a long distance so they're showing off um from the to the females so this is a, a party in the front business in the back yes the, and all of and all of these birds of and all of these birds sit up on 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 snags and posts and things and sing yeah, tall, tall where, where they can be yeah. seen and um yeah, so Tim uh callback uh shares a, a photo of the yellow-throated long claw um in in the facebook so you can see what that bird looks like too it's a meadowlarky look. So Nat asks if, if this is an Eastern or a Western. I believe this is a Western. Um, it's got some, some yellow coming up that. into the, the Melar. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I was more interested in the pose of the bird for putting this comp <laughs> yeah. together. Um, 
and uh, than I was which species of metal arc it is because we're really trying to, to talk about the differences between metal arc species and dick sissel. And though I did so, learn uh, from uh, Dave Irons the best way to tell a western metal arc from an eastern metal arc in Texas and places where you where you might encounter both of them, and that is if it flies off to the east, it's an eastern metal arc, and if it flies off to the west, it's a western metal arc. Hundred okay. percent of the time. Yeah. All right. Well. So, yeah, so um, <laughs> you, you do want to look at you do want to look at that yellow in the malar in kind of the mustache uh, that's more prominent in a western and westerns tend to be like paler just all over more generally um, whereas eastern metal arcs are kind of more boldly black and black and brown. Yeah. Getting back to the dick sizzle. Yes. Look back at to that. The dick Sorry. Look at the head pattern and look at the look at the structure here. Um, the 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 dick sizzle again. It's got that big big monster bill for for cracking mm. seeds um both birds have a lot of strong pattern going on on the head and and neck and face um but look at the crown the dick sizzle has a plain kind of greenish brown crown with supercilium with with white lines over the eyes and look at the the tricolored uh or the the, tr the three stripes on the crown of the metal arc very very different and in all plumages metal larks have that striped crown so i mean if you can see it from the front or the back if it's got that really boldly striped crown um that's a good indication that you're looking at a metal lark if it's uh you know a yeah, bird good like ways to tell these birds the apart field. in flight as well um dick sizzle has a really distinctive call that's really kind of like a buzzy zzz, zzz, like um sticking a fork in a electric socket um, mm -hmm. it's got it's real electrical sounding call that's very different from a lot of other different birds and uh metal arcs they have that that stuttery flight i don't know if you've ever flushed a metal arc from a from a post or something they have that real quick little flat glide flat, 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 glide and then they kind of cruise into the tall grasses so um, mm -hmm. if you see that sort of flight from a long distance away uh, you can be sure you've seen a seen a metal arc and of course metal arcs have very bold white outer tail feathers and that right. is yeah, that something much. that really jumps out at you um Whereas, you know, the, the, the Dick Sissel tends to, uh, again, look like a sparrow flying away. It doesn't yeah, do exactly. any of the, the, the things. And um, the calls, of course, are, as Nate said, very different, Eastern, Western, and Dick Sissel. Um, so as we move here to the next one, remember the, the shape. Uh, so get a good look at this Dick Sissel and just, you know, just kind of feast your eyes on the Dick Sissel and and get a good feel for how it looks and how it feels and the shape and everything and um so we're now going to uh look at another bird from north carolina and Hello. uh yeah and look at that bill boy that really looks very similar to the bird we were just looking at i mean in fact it looks identical and that's because it's a female dick sissel yeah and so you'll yeah, see very that similar the... yeah we talked about looking at a bird's um gestalt its vibes whatever you want to call it the feel of the bird when you look at it what you kind of get the impression of it and uh yeah you can see it's kind of chunky big and round that massive bill stands out and uh it's got a little bit of the pattern that we saw on the male dick sizzle obviously mm -hmm. without the big black patch um but it's similar it's like a muted version of that of that palette, which is very similar, what you'd see in a lot of those birds with strong sexual dimorphism, like a, like mm -hmm. a sizzle. And this is, and this is a spring bird, obviously, uh, because I think it was photographed today or yesterday. Um, so it's got, it's got a, a, you know, a noticeable amount of yellow on the breast. Um, very often they do not. Um, they just have maybe a little bit of yellow in the eyebrow. Yeah. You, you'll see how the face pattern is, is similar, but as Nate said, it's, it's muted. Um, you know, learning female birds is a really good way to be familiar with, you know, all of the plumages. Um, mm -hmm. and if you, if you spend a lot of time like working female, females of the more colorful birds like warblers and, and cardinalids and things like that, um, you, you get a really good feel for the gestalt of the bird. Now, Dick Sissel is a really confusing bird for a lot of people. And there's a reason for that. 
and that's because it looks like a lot of things. So here you can see we have the male Dixissel uh, on the left. Look at that bright chestnut in the wings there on that male Dixissel. Mary yeah. Rose Kent notes that that's in there. Hello, Mary. And and you can and you can see you can see the similarities between the male and female Dixissel. That's the same bill, the same basic face pattern, um, mm -hmm. and everything else. But then over there. Uh, to the right, we have a couple of birds that are frequently mistaken, especially the bird immediately to the right, which mm -hmm. is a female house sparrow. And to make matters even more confusing, in the fall and winter, when dick sissels hang around, uh, rarely, um, dick sissel is an obligate migrant that, that migrates to northern South America. Um, but every once in a while, one will stick around. And when they do, they associate with house sparrows. <laughs> Even even dick sissels think house sparrows are sort of like them. <laughs> yeah, they enough. do. Yeah. And yeah, I no, think that the the, the 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 winter I think the winter records you know the winter records in Canada of dick sissel which of which there's only a handful, I if I they're almost all at feeders hanging out with house sparrows. That's um, exactly right. I uh, I did uh, the Super Bowl of birding many years ago, and uh, that's in Essex County, Massachusetts, so north of Boston, and it's in the middle of the winter, and. Um, yeah, we were we we spent some time looking for a dick sizzle that was hanging out with a massive flock of house sparrows at someone's feeder that they were throwing corn on the ground and attracting all the house sparrows. But there was a dick sizzle supposedly there. We didn't see it, but that's where it was. Yeah, so uh, you know, look at look at the 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 differences now. I mean, there's there's superficially these birds are very similar. It's got a pale eyebrow stripe. It's got a big chunky bill. Um, it's just kind of grayish and brownish all over, kind of mm -hmm. palish legs. Um, but notice that that the bluish color of the bill of the dick sissel. It's it's yeah. always got that that heavy kind of blue gray bill. Whereas the the house sparrow, depending on whether it's male or female, can be anything from black to this kind of yellowish brown color. So that's the first giveaway. Yeah. Um, the second you know, big giveaway is the color and tone. The house sparrow tends to be browner. Um, and if we saw the back of this bird, house sparrow has two bold kind of yellowish tan braces down the middle of the back that are yep. kind of unique. Um, there's, there's really no other little brown bird that has those broad uh, yellowish tan stripes down the center of the back. Now, yeah, then, they also have that, that Tweety Bird cheap that yes. uh, house sparrows are always making that you can hear anytime you drive through any sort of sizable urban area with the windows down. Um, and it's obviously very different from the Dick Sissel Zeet. So um, yeah, mm -hmm. it's a good way to pick them out if there's one around, finding that finding that sound that the Dick Sissels make. Uh, and the other bird here is a female brown-headed cowbird. And you'll notice again, the, the shape is somewhat similar, but the, the bill of the dick sissel is the heaviest of all of them here. Uh, it's kind of got that, that grayish, blackish color, um, but the bill is, is finer. Now, the, the, the cowbird is a blackbird, and it's, it's, got, that, it's got that sharper bill. Um, mm -hmm. what, what confuses people often with dick sissel and cowbird is the white throat. The dick sissel mm -hmm. has a noticeable white throat, so does the cowbird. But, you know, you look at the overall color and tone, and they're very different. Cowbirds tend to be very slaty gray um, mm -hmm. with maybe a little brownish cast to them, but they're, 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 not, uh, they're not the same color and tone and just overall, uh, yeah, again, the shape, the, is, the shape is a little different. Yeah, the cowbird definitely looks more like a blackbird, kind of longer and It's a little lanky, slimmer. It is, yeah, though it is definitely, like, probably the most sparrowy blackbird there is with a, the shortest tail compared to other blackbirds compared to sparrows it's you know as you say it's slimmer dick sizzles are a real chonker real big and round bird with a with a big with a big old bill yeah Stu mckenzie says this winter in port rowan ontario dick sizzle with house sparrows at a feeder um and scott heron uh says in the northeast they have us picking through house sparrows much more than we normally would no i doubt. found some good I found a lot of good birds hanging out with house sparrows in the middle of winter, yeah. um, including a, a dick sizzle once. Slumming a little bit, but um, yeah. it's always worth checking. All right. Uh, so 
sticking with the boldly colored birds in field. Yeah, there's boldly another open country bird with a pattern sort of uh, pattern. Yeah. Uh, this one comes to us from California. And again, here we have a bird with black and white and yellow and brown and a bold pattern and walking around in a field. Very similar to the last two we've been talking about, Meadowlark and uh, Dick Sissel. But now look at this bird's shape. Uh, it has a thin, small bill. It's kind of long. It's got kind of a long tail. Like a slender, yeah. The bird is slender. Um, very different. Very different from uh, the Meadowlark that we were talking about earlier. And so here mm -hmm. you can see the differences between this bird and a meadowlark. Uh, this bird that we're discussing being a horned lark, which is lark. not <laughs> lark. Lark in this case just um, uh, like refers an open to country bird. An open country birds that that sings um, are, yeah. are there is a there is a family of birds uh, in the in the you know Eurasia and Africa that are larks. It's a lark family, a laudidae, of which and horned lark is an actual lark. lark. Like it's a it, taxonomically, it is related to those birds. It's a whole Arctic species, which means it's found throughout the northern hemisphere in the uh, in the Eurasia in Europe. They tend to call it they call it shore lark, uh, but that's the same species. Um, maybe a little bit better. I don't know. I don't know which species yeah. is better. You don't usually see the, you don't, I don't know which name is better. I, 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 you don't usually see the horns and you do frequently see them kind of walking around on the, on open yeah. shores. When uh, you do but, see the horns though, it's, it's pretty darn noticeable. It's, it's cool. Um, yeah. And uh, they definitely are. They, legit... they look like little yeah. horns. <laughs> yeah. Metal lark is not a lark. As we said, no, it, it is, is a, not. It's a black it an, bird. It is an icterid. It is yeah. a black bird. Yeah. And what's, what's cool about horned larks is there's, uh, as Nate said, it's a whole Arctic species, and there are uh, found a around the world, the, the northern hemisphere. Um, there are a number of species, subspecies. Um, yeah, I don't know how many, but maybe, what, 10, 15? <laughs> I would say more than that, but I don't Probably know exactly more than that. Many. Yeah. yeah. And across uh, the ABA area, they range from rather pale like this bird to... Mm -hmm. As like bold yellow and black as a metal lark almost. Yeah, um, yeah. Our, our eastern ones tend to be very bold, um, and it's because our, our grasslands tend to be greener and wetter and darker, whereas out in California or in the west they're drier, and so the birds are paler, mm -hmm. so like desert birds. And and so you know again here you know we're uh, we're talking about gestalt overall shape and form and uh, you know look nice. at how slim. Look at how slim the horned lark is, the, the small, dark bill, um, and just it's kind of long and slim versus the kind of chunkiness with that big spike-like bill of mm. the meadow lark. And, uh, you know, even though these birds are superficially similar in, in pattern, color, and, and tone, um, they're really very different. Uh, now, yeah. in all of these matchups, I've been making the birds the same size because when you're in the field and you see a bird by itself it's really hard to tell how big or small it is mm -hmm. and we get into we get into long discussions all the time with people who see a bird perched at the top of a tree or flying by itself or whatever and they say oh it was huge or it was tiny and we're like well how do you know you know a bird at the top of a tree is very hard to, to really discern how big or small it is. Same thing with a bird walking by itself out in a field. Um, if these two birds were walking side by side, the meadow lark would be very noticeably larger. It would be enormous. Yeah, it would, yeah, it would be twice, twice the size of the horned lark. Yeah, and probably in mass closer to four times the size because, uh, yeah. you know, uh, it's a very big, around, pot-bellied bird. Is a, yep. is a metal lark, whereas as as we said earlier, uh, horned lark is sort of lanky and slender, um, yep. and they they do similar things. Um, you know, horned lark does a little scurry thing, like the roadrunner that we see. So they run real fast and they stop, and they run real fast and then they stop on the open country. Whereas uh, you know, metal larks tend to, when you see them on the ground, they they're a little more deliberate. And they like. both and they do both tend to just kind of walk and chicken peck, um, yeah, and just kind of move along and. Uh, methodically just work through the, the substrate. Um, 
Yeah, Hornlark is funny. I, I have a theory that it is probably the most common underreported bird uh, in North America because they are they are really almost everywhere. Anytime you yes. get kind of an open kind of fallow field, you're you're likely to see a a horned lark, or if you likely to host horned larks, you may not see them. That's the thing. Um, right. And but, people are generally not always familiar with the the flight call uh, that they make when they fly over. It, it may register as something slightly different or slightly off, um, but not maybe enormously so and so uh people tend to miss them when they fly over they're they're not always an easy bird to find though they are yeah. actually quite common and the, and the song the song is uh is 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 high pitched and tinkling yeah, and when they tinkly, when they sing it yeah. from high in the air it just seems like it's coming from everywhere and they're very hard to yeah, find exactly right. in this in the sky um and even when they sing on the ground they're hard to find um because they tend to like run through the, the run through the rows of a field, um, yeah, and in the, in um, the fallow in the like the trough of the field, and you, they're hard to see if you're on the road looking, uh, looking at this field. You know, and one more thing: when birds fly up off the the, the roadside fields, uh, off the roadsides, um, you know, the first thing you'll see on a meadowlark is a brown bird with bright white outer tail feathers, mm -hmm. and it's pretty noticeable. A horned lark. A brown bird with a black tail and then yeah. you may or may not notice that it has white outer tail feathers but you see a brown bird with a black tail. black tail now now tristan just brings up uh what i was about to to talk about in a moment thanks tristan um horned lark is one of the earliest breeding passerines that we have uh in the aba area in places like illinois and wisconsin they're already there may be young running around right now um they breed in march we have records of them nesting in february uh in in illinois um and so you may see a juvenile horned lark right now and in the springtime when people see juvenile horned larks it is one of the most confusing birds you will ever run across yeah it doesn't look like anything the bill is a little shorter than the adult it's got this kind of pebbly pattern, um, and uh, it's, yeah, it's kind of scary. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Stu the says fledgling similar. It yeah, is, the shape but is similar to the adults, but it's not like something that would, you know, stand out. Yeah, and you know, and point, it'll. Right? They're not supposed to. <laughs> Stu says uh, they have fledglings in Ontario already. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, and that, that is one of the most confusing birds. So I haven't seen one come up in What's This Bird yet this spring, but certainly there will be one uh, in the coming week or two. Um, but yeah, the juvenile horned lark is uh, one of my favorite because it's, it just, it does, it's utterly unique and just doesn't look like anything. <laughs> right. Yeah. All righty. And, uh, Again, yeah, we're going to talk about we're going to we're going to talk about shape because that's <laughs> mostly what we can see here on this bird, um, and it's this down from the beaches by you. What do so? What can we? What are we seeing here? Yeah, so this is. Um, um, I know we don't like to talk about size, but this is a very large looking short. And I think when people talk about size, they typically what they mean when they say that is proportion. Like the proportion mm -hmm. gives the impression that the size is large. And in this bird, it has a, the head compared to the body. The body is very large compared to the head, which gives you the impression of a large shorebird with the long bill and the long legs. Uh, the little tiny small shorebirds, the peeps, uh, the head looks much larger compared to the body. So this is a large body, small head. So we, we can probably safely say that that is a large shorebird. Um, generally sort of gray, but the things that sort of stand out to me are those barrings on the, the barring on the breast and on the sides and the eye ring. It's got a nice little mm -hmm. eye ring that you can see and a very thick bill, uh, and very thick legs too. It's just kind of a overall, like kind of a large looking, you know, sturdy looking shorebird. Yeah. Uh, which and, is and notable for a family that, that can look very slight sometimes. Mm hmm. And, uh, the, the, the bird it's most frequently confused with is the one now that is uh to the left of it here which is yeah. greater yellow legs and the bird we're discussing of course is a willet um willet. yeah and They're the same genus tringa yeah or are they? and they used to be 
Uh, I think they still are, although the shorebirds get changed like every 16 months, so mm -hmm. it's it's uh, it's hard to tell <laughs> where they yeah. are anymore. Um, but again, look at the how stout the bill yeah. on the will it is, and just overall what a like that Nate said, just what a thick bird it is. Yeah, robust. Um, yeah, and heavy legs, and also notice that even backlit um, and dark like we have these birds here you can see the yellow legs on a yellow legs and usually yep usually i mean i've it's it's very rare that you can't i mean maybe if they're covered in mud um but you know I will there's say a... where i live on the southeast coast i tend not to see these two species in the same sort of place too so habitat is a really great clue uh willet is a beachfront bird so it will be walking around on the beaches pecking in the surf uh, frequently along with like sanderlings and uh, things like that. I mean, mm -hmm. they just walk right out there. Whereas uh, yellow legs, I tend to think of as a marsh bird, a marsh piper. So anytime you've got like a sound side, uh, maybe even as close as like a hundred meters away from the beach shore, but it's sound side, there aren't as many waves. There's a lot of marsh grasses growing, Spartina, whatever. Um, that's where the yellow legs is going to going to be. Um, mm -hmm. Though they do sort of feed in similar ways, they're they're going to be in different different places. Uh, so that's usually helps me, you know, rule a few things out before I before I have to go too much deeper. Now the interesting thing is now that's, thing is now that's in salt. Now a... that's in salt water in the middle of the country, yeah. like places well, we've been talking true. about, like Kiveran yeah. and the Great Lakes. They're going to be right walking around together. Walking around and, together. Yeah. And the Willet is going to be bigger. Um, I made up these again, pretty much the same size, just yeah. because we're 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 assuming that the bird is by itself. But yeah, you can see what I said about proportion. Um, mm -hmm. whereas the, the will, it looks like the body is huge and the head is small, whereas the, they look a little bit more closer in size, uh, for the yellow legs. And that's because the yellow legs is a little bit of a smaller bird as Greg said. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a little more slender. It's, it's got a, that it doesn't have as much of a, of a chest. Now, again, birds have feathers and they puff and they slim, but this right. is just, you know, we're talking in generalities here, but look at the bill shape. Look at this, the big spike, like heavy bill of the mm -hmm. will it compared to the more slender uh, and and slightly upturned bill of mm -hmm. the greater yellow legs. And if we if we threw a lesser yellow legs in here, which I didn't have time for, uh, smaller still. Yeah. It would be smaller still and dainty. It has a it has a bill like a toothpick um, mm -hmm. compared to these two birds. Now, the fun and, thing with this willet is uh, to try and determine which population it comes from. Yeah, so I knew you were going to bring crossover that up. Crossover <laughs> period right now in the, uh, in the, on the East Coast because we typically, you know, our birds in the summer are the eastern willets. So willets, I'll, I'll back up a little bit further. Willets are in two populations. There's an East Coast breeding species, subspecies, and there's a Western, you know, Western Great Plains, Great Basin breeding yep. bird. And those birds winter in the southeast united states whereas mm -hmm. the um whereas the eastern birds that breed here winter in the caribbean and, and northern uh, northern south america and they do kind of there are a few weeks a year that they kind of intersect with each other and then you kind of get to you know have the fun of, of figuring them out the western birds tend to be you know we talked about will it being a robust shorebird well the western birds tend to be a little bit more gracile, like the the legs are longer, the bill is longer, the the overall appearance is paler. They're kind of a paler gray, whereas the eastern birds are just really finely barred. Um, this one gives me the impression a little bit more of a of a western bird, but um, I would like to see it moving around to be a little bit more sure. Of I I agree. Um, it's uh, kind of a a, a, character, a a characterization that I've that I've come up with for. Uh, eastern and western willets is as uh, as nate says you know the the western willet is a, is a is more gracile by comparison um, yeah right as a comparison the, yeah the 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 eastern willet looks like something you don't want to get into a bar fight with it's yeah, it's, it's a got beefy shorebird it's just got kind of a mean expression the bill is is heavy i believe that it's a uh, it's a, a crab specialist that's got a heavier bill for crunching yeah crab they shells the crabs yeah um and they they just have a a very different look and this bird looks like a like a western willet to me um, that's my impression yeah but that's, it's usually easy to tell when you see them moving around on the beach and you see yeah. them kind of walking and and then you that impression between like the stockier eastern birds and the lankier western birds becomes more obvious uh, especially if they're side by side 
but right. um which they which they pre- which they will be this time of year uh, on the beaches in in South Carolina. And who knows, we may have two uh, two species of willets at some point in I the future. I think that's probably likely, but you know, the taxonomic overlords have said no, and <laughs> though they though that decision is not final. Certainly, the birds have a say in it. <laughs> they know the difference. Yeah. So, um, any discussion? Well, nothing. Nothing more than what we've just said. Yeah, that um, was the the proposal that was determined by the NACC, the North American Classification Committee. I don't know. It was at three years ago now. I, it was around that time. Um, and they they dismissed it or they did not accept it. And, I think they ta- um, I think they tabled it. Um, that may be. Which that's usually the case on those things. Even when they say no, it's like we need more information. Can you get us more information and make it exactly and, and exactly what they needed? I thought they had enough information, but I'm not a tech just <coughs> a birder who wants both birds on my state list. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, it's it, it is it is kind of I look at those two birds and I can see the differences, and it seems fairly obvious to yeah. me. But but but. I'm not looking at genetic studies, you know, there there has to be a level of separation that's greater than, Oh, they look different. Um, Right. Right. It's a, it's where, where you draw the line. Right. So there, there is a difference between them. Um, They sound different. They look different. They Mm breed in different places. There's no overlap between where they breed, like thousands of miles between where they breed. So they've been, they've been split from each other behaviorally for a very long time. Um, but you know where where do you draw that line? Where do you say this is a full species and this is not a full species? That's kind of uh, that's that's the debate. That's where the debate is. And uh, yeah, you know, they, yeah. They, some haven't seen enough. Some enough people have not seen enough to to call it. So that's sort of where we are. But you know, come back in fifteen thousand years, and uh, it might be <laughs> it might be easier. Well, I mean, in fifteen thousand years, the eastern willet might look like a crab plover or, or an oyster yeah, catcher knows? with that big That'd bill. Be awesome, you know, that way. <laughs> yeah, it seems that it seems the way they're headed. Um, yeah. So uh, that's that's it for our our photo discussion today, guys. If uh, if you have any questions or want to discuss anything, hit us up in the in the various chats or comments. We're keeping an eye and, on uh, it. And we've uh, we've got about another five seven minutes here, so uh, let's hear from you guys. Yeah, um, if you would, while people are putting their putting their comments in into the in mind and, and typing them down i will pause and say hey if you enjoy us chatting about birds the aba has a lot of resources that may be right up your alley uh including you know our various facebook groups um you can go to our website you can check out a lot of the things that we're doing um, we have columns about birds we have a free podcast that i host that's weekly that's all about birds and people that are doing bird things um, we have a lot of cool stuff that's going on in the ABA. Um, and if you'd like to support us doing that stuff, you see where I'm going with this. Uh, right up there above Greg is an ABA.org slash join. We have a number of different memberships available uh, from e-memberships to family memberships to memberships that get all our magazines in the mail, if you like that sort of thing, to those who may prefer them uh, on their tablets or however you read your magazines these days, however people read magazines these days. Um, check us out, aba.org that, that joint slash aba.org. Aba.org. <laughs> Wait, A-B-A-org. you got me doing it. Aba.org. Run, you do. Just keep, just keep typing <laughs> things in until you hit us. A uh, 50 cent description of solitary sandpiper versus yellow legs. Mm, um, yellow, solitary short. Yeah, it's got shorter legs. Short. It's it's just kind of dumpy looking compared to yellow legs, which are uh, more gracile looking. Um, it's it's got a stockier bill. It's a, kind of a thicker bill. Um, and Darker the spots green. they're kind of gr- more greener the, with uh, the smaller the, spots. And and the smaller spots the 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 impression the impression of a yellow legs is a gray back with like salt and pepper thrown all over yeah, it. Speckly. Um, yeah, yeah. Whereas a solitary sandpiper looks like a dark gray back with with pattern spotting, um, there's some kind of there's a pattern to it. I will also frequently see solitary sandpipers like all over the place, any sort of body of water. They're much more um, uh, general in their preferences for water than say yellow legs are, which really do like kind of the mud flats, um, uh, water treatment facilities, things like that. Whereas I've like I've seen solitaries in 
like impoundments that are completely surrounded by woods on all sides. Absolutely. They'll be picking along in the edges. Uh, I, I would never see a yellow legs there. I would be extremely surprised to see yellow legs there. I'll say yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, um, here we see we see solitary sandpipers in places like woodland ponds, um, creeks that that go through little op, you know little open pastures and things like that. Mm -hmm. Again, places where you'd never see a yellow leg. Much more general. Yep. Um, Stu McKenzie drops a comment that we're just going to ignore and Stu. move along. Um, so. <laughs> hybrids who wants to talk yeah. about hybrids and especially hybrid ducks it's like no we're not going to talk about hybrid ducks sorry they're all probably <laughs> they're all probably hybrid a little bit um yeah the the eye ring thing is uh heidi heidi mccullough brings up the eye ring and she she notes that the two birds that we just had up both have eye rings and true. solitary eye rings has eye rings a lot of eye rings um it's really subtle and and maybe uh next time uh I will put together a comp so you can see the differences. But in general, the solitary sandpiper, it has a more noticeable eye ring than a yeah. yellow legs. Um, I agree with that. And I think that has to do with your description of the bird's back. Whereas you said um, the, 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 you know, the yellow legs have kind of a salt and pepper speckly all over kind of back that, that goes all the way up to the head. Um, right. Whereas the solitary has like the, the spots are not as there aren't as thick. And so it's got almost like a hood and then you see right. the eye ring and it just is like, bam, it's like just stands right. out a lot. Whereas you have to maybe look a little bit more for the eye ring on a yellow legs. It's there though. Absolutely. Um, Christy beam, brand new to birding. Can we recommend a field guide an actual book? Boy, can we, um, all of them my, all uh, buy as many that's as not, you can. That's not true. No. Um, well, my my favorite are the Sibley guides. Um, depending on where you live, I would pick up either the Eastern or Western Sibley guides. If you want, get the big one that covers the entire ABA area uh, to keep on the bedside or the coffee table uh, or at the desk. Um, but I I There's really a like Sibley doesn't call it a field guide because it's yep. not really something you. Can it's take not. The field. Um, although a lot of people do Unless keep it in the car. Back. Um, yeah, but. Uh, Sibley has uh, a talent for uh, depicting the gestalt, the look and feel of species that is is really wonderful. And um, that, it, I think he does better than, than any other guide out there across the whole scope of the book. Yeah, yeah, I'd agree with that. That's the advantage of the single, the single uh, artist guide. Um, I would also suggest if we're going to suggest like maybe a photo guide, depending on where you live, uh, Christy, check out the ABA series of photo Absolutely. guides. Absolutely, um, those are great. Brian Small does the photos, and he's a, an amazing photographer. And um, the the real advantage of those guides is that they're all written by local people in that state, and so you don't just get the information on how to identify the bird; you get the information on where to find the bird. Sometimes, like really specifically, and that's useful too because we talk about maybe soft field marks like. Uh, location, time, place, habitat um, that aren't necessarily, you know, field marks on the bird, but field marks sort of around the bird that you should think about when you're trying to identify the bird. Getting that information in your head is going to narrow that identification down and make it a lot easier for you. Um, and those uh, ABA field guys do a great job with that just because they're, they're focused on just one state. And if you uh, are in North Carolina, you can pick up the ABA yeah, field guide wrote, authored I, I by Nate Swick. Yeah. I was going to get to that a box of them around here. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're in Illinois, uh, our own Michael Redder authored the Illinois guide. And I helped with that uh, a bit. Um, but yeah, as Nate, as Nate said, though, the ABA guides are really cool because they're, they're not field guides in the sense that Sibley or Kaufman or Peterson is where it's mm -hmm. like, okay, here's the, here's all the plumages and here's how you identify them it's more of an introduction to the birds that you're most likely to come across. Right. And it's uh, a really good way to learn what's around you. Um, so, you know, if you're, if you're in New York or Illinois, wherever, California, um, these are the birds that you're most likely to see. Uh, and with, with descriptions, not only of uh, habitat and, and habit, but, on a local scale that makes sense so mm -hmm. you know when you're when you're talking about a bird like um 
well, like the Willets, like you were just talking about how right. the Willets and Yellow Legs separate themselves in on the coast, which they don't do in Illinois. Right. Yeah. Your description of a Willet uh, would be different from mine in Illinois, and those books reflect right. that. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Good point. Um, Heidi McCulloch says she, she found the old Colorado ABA lanes guide amazingly helpful. I'm sure they still are. Uh, yeah, those those lane guides that ABA used to produce. Um, I don't think a new one has come out in a long time, but they're essentially like uh, like where to go specifically to find the birds. Like they're they're pretty amazing in their in their level of detail. It'll be like yeah. go down Farm Road 493, find the intersection to uh, Highway 25, and look on the third fence post on your left, and there will be uh, I don't know like a couch's kingbird or whatever you want. Yeah. Um, but yeah, those those are those those are pretty amazing guides. Um, and even some of them are are pretty old, but the 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 information in them is pretty useful. They're not really field guides, so to speak. They're more like no. bird finding guides. Exactly. But, um, they're, they're neat birds. Neat, neat guides, I should say. Neat guides. They're all neat birds, but they're neat guides. Yeah. Well, we are we are rolling up exactly on an hour here, so we are Boom. pretty yeah, much well. out of time. And again, as Nate said, if you enjoy what we do, if you enjoy this bi-weekly program um right and uh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> become a stakeholder help us put this stuff together help us keep the lights on and produce all the things that uh, we love to do for the birding community and Indeed. uh um thanks for watching everybody we'll be back in a couple weeks and, yep uh talk to you about birds again or talk right about birds again whatever you want